Hello, and welcome to Don't Ignore the Elephant, the podcast where we talk about the stuff that no one else will, the elephant in the room. I'm Liz O'Riordan. I'm a breast cancer surgeon with breast cancer, and during my career, I've had a lot of elephants to deal with. I've learned that talking about them, getting them out in the open, can help you know that you're not alone. Whether it's cancer or other illnesses, mental health issues, sexual problems, bullying, harassment, or the death of a loved one, there are loads of things that can be hard to discuss. I know how powerful it can be to hear someone else talk honestly about their own problems. Some of my guests have lived these experiences, whilst others have dedicated their lives to helping those who have. I'm going to be chatting to them about it and asking the questions everyone else is too afraid to ask. In this episode, we'll be talking about death and dying. For many of us, death is the ultimate elephant in the room. It's the one thing we don't talk about. But not for Dr. Catherine Mannix. She's a specialist in palliative care medicine who spent over 30 years of her life helping people with incurable advanced illnesses to have a peaceful death. Her mission is for all of us to be better informed and less afraid about dying. She's written two beautiful books on the subject. Her first is the Sunday Times bestseller, With the End in Mind, How to Live and Die Well. Her latest work, Listen, How to Find the Words for Tender Conversations, came out a couple of weeks ago. Both encourage us all to start thinking and talking about the last days of our lives so we can help our loved ones make the very best of the time they have left. Today, we're going to look death square in the face to find out what really happens when we die and hopefully make it all seem a little less scary. If you listen to the first episode of Don't Ignore the Elephant, you'll know that I had virtual cocktails with Greg Wise during lockdown. I asked Catherine to be my plus one, as she's also a patron of the charity End of Life Doulas UK. Greg says he's her biggest fan, but I'm ready to fight him for the title. Now you're going (laughs) to find out why. Welcome, Catherine, to the podcast. (laughs) Liz, thank you very, very much. It's gorgeous to be here. Oh, it's lovely to talk to you. I hope you've got a good cup of tea and a large pile of biscuits. No, I absolutely have got that cup of tea. So if the slurping listeners do forgive us. (laughs) Now, I wanted to start with just some basics, because for a lot of people, the terms we use around death and dying don't make any sense. Um, And as a trainee, like many people, I thought palliative medicine was just for patients who were dying. Can you explain to us all what palliative medicine really is? With pleasure. Uh, Palliative care is the care, really, of people whose lives and well-being are disturbed by symptoms of an illness. And what most of medicine is trying to do, probably with the noble exception of surgery, is to minimise symptoms of illnesses rather than absolutely cure those illnesses. So when you think about diabetes, for example, we don't cure diabetes. We give people treatments that Mm. make it possible to live alongside it. But for some illnesses, there isn't a treatment that actually reverses the illness and holds it in abeyance. And so the symptoms of that illness might become progressively more difficult for the person to live with. And Mm -hmm. palliative care steps in at that point, at any point along an illness trajectory from newly diagnosed to point of death and anywhere in between to say, okay, what can we do about the symptoms so that you feel well enough to live your best life? Right. And obviously the best way of managing symptoms is to cure the illness, right? Yeah. So generally in palliative care, we tend to see, but not always see, people whose illness isn't going to be cured. And perhaps in a little while, I've got something to say about seeing people very early when there's going to be more treatment and working alongside our local surgeons um, to meet people at point of diagnosis in order to get them well enough to have the rest of their treatment. That sounds amazing. I'm glad you mentioned surgery because obviously I'm a surgeon. Can I ask what didn't draw you to the world of blood and pyjamas and poo? Oh, I think you probably just hit the nail on the head right there. Actually, do you know <laughs> what? Oh, in, in the olden days, when, when we qualified, we did um, house jobs, six months medicine, yeah, six months surgery. Me too. And I loved the surgery ambience. I mm-hmm. was keen to get into theatre and assist in surgery. I have my own little varicose veins list, oh, wow. which is terrifying and wouldn't happen now, I don't think. <laughs> um, 
But it's like a bloodbath, isn't it, when you do veins? Oh, ab- absolutely terrifying. Each time I think, oh, don't let this one be quite so bloody. Um, <laughs> and the thing that was really, really lovely about surgery was that it cured people. Mm. You know, people came in and they they had a hernia, they had appendicitis, they had an ingrowing toenail, they had varicose veins, they had gastric cancer. And yeah. the surgery actually could remove the illness or reverse an obstruction or whatever the thing was. Um, medicine doesn't do that, really. Medicine no. modifies disease processes to make people able to live with them. Um, but I think the thing about surgery was that because I was in a peripheral hospital and mainly people came in with something acute and we sorted them out and they went home again. Yeah. It was too much of a snapshot right. with the patient. And I realized that one of the things that I'd enjoyed in medicine, which I'd done first, mm-hmm. was meeting people and reviewing them and seeing them over time and getting to know them. Yeah. And I think partly because my medical house job was a hematology and medicine ward. So I saw people with life limiting illnesses from yeah. the very beginning and realized that actually that was the area where I wanted to work so I went over to medicine on the dark side I don't blame you and I I will forgive you (laughs) thank you now I saw my first dead body on the day one of medical school I I remember it we walked into the dissection lab and the covers were whipped off 40 dead bodies we were meant to dissect and it was horrific do you remember your first time you saw a dead body yeah it it was the same experience in my medical school yeah but We all gathered in the lecture theatre and we had a talk, first of all, from the head of anatomy Mm -hmm. who talked to us about the bodies we were about to meet having been people, um, the generosity of the people who had donated their bodies for our benefit, the respect that those people were entitled to, the fact that we were not going to be told their names so that their identities would be respected. Mm -hmm. But if we felt it helped us to respect the person whose body we were dissecting, to give them a name, we should feel free to do that. So we had a kind of induction before we were taken into the room and then we were gathered around our individual trolleys with the person's body on under that green plastic sheet. It probably looks the same everywhere, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, With our anatomy demonstrator and anatomy demonstrators were people who were on a surgical career trajectory who needed to learn a little bit more detail about yeah. the anatomy of the bodies they were going to be cutting before they could cut and do some damage. Um, sometimes they were quite cute. Some, sometimes they were less cute. Um, yeah. And uh, actually our first year anatomy demonstrator went on to be a, a, a world-renowned orthopaedic surgeon and he was extremely sweet wow. and gentle with us mm-hmm. and talked to us again before the sheet came up that, you know, this is... This is a privilege. And if actually you feel a bit wishy-washy, sit down if you need to, leave the room if you need to. Obviously, we'll all talk about you the minute your back is turned. Yeah. Um, And just kind of a bit of light humour. And it was only at that point, you know, when we lifted the sheet and realised that the body that we were being able to dissect was an elderly woman. And they look very, very different after the preservation process compared with they do, don't they? the first time I saw a kind of newly dead person, which was in fact only a couple of months later when our demonstrator mm-hmm. invited us to come one at a time and join him on an overnight shift in casualty. So I was spending a, an overnight in casualty and we were called out to an ambulance where somebody had been blue lighted in CPR during Gosh. the transfer and how old are you you've been 18 at the time so yeah 18 nearly 19 probably yeah and the thing that was so striking to me about this dead person was that he didn't really look dead there was no doubt no. at all that the woman whose body we were dissecting was a dead person and she'd been dead some considerable time but this was somebody who still was warm, yeah. still looked slightly pink, looked a little bit surprised, I thought, the expression on his face. Mm-hmm. And I just wasn't sure. And when my demonstrator shone a light in his eyes, listened to his chest, checked there was no yeah. heartbeat, no breath sounds, all the rest of it, and then said to the paramedics, you know, let's call the time now. So they stopped their CPR. Yeah. And that was the time of death. But obviously, he'd probably been dead 
during the journey even Mm. while they were doing their attempts at resuscitation and I couldn't get out of the ambulance I couldn't quite step away I wasn't sure and he was really kind he came back and he said to me this is your first time isn't it and he showed me how to listen to the chest and how to shine a light in the eyes and you know I have the 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 end of my stethoscope on backwards so I plonked my stethoscope on his chest and all I could hear was the nurses and the ambulance men discussing what sort of coffee the ambulance (laughs) you know the paramedics would like I felt so silly but it was so powerful to listen to that yeah completely silent chest silence yeah I remember feeling the pulse of the first body I was asked to verify and I was I was sure they could feel a pulse I had my hand on their wrist Mm. and my CE had to come along and say no you're feeling your own pulse you have to put your hand on your temple so you know what your pulse is and actually realise they don't have one because you just, it's so hard to accept they've gone. It really is, isn't it? And you know, the, the silence of that chest wasn't a, a negative thing. It was a positive thing. It was yeah. wrongly silent. It was brutally silent. And that was really, really thought provoking for me that this man had been talking, had been living his life, had been with his people. 20 minutes earlier and now it's over yeah really really interesting and thought-provoking experience for someone who's really just still a child completely I mean 18 it's amazing what you're Mm. kind of thrown into isn't it yeah how different was it when you saw someone die in front of you for the first time I don't remember the first person I saw dying and I think it's because I worked in a haematology ward as a student and loved it which is why I applied for their house job Mm. and there were so many people reaching the end of their lives because we didn't have the sort of treatments for the leukemias that we have now. But I can remember several during my first attachment. And the thing that I remember was the nurses realising that doctors didn't have the relationship with patients that was the relationship I had assumed I was going to have. No. Nurses did. And that, oh, I might have made a real miscalculation in my career choice that was much more fundamentally wrong than medicine or surgery which was medicine or nursing yeah and the nurses were so kind to me because it was a real major wobble and they realized that actually at the point where the medical team have to move away to go and do the next medical task yeah I didn't feel that business was finished yeah and they kind of took me under their wing and they took me with them with the sickest people with whom the medical team spent the least time because their medical need was the least. It was nursing care and caring care that they really required. And so they they let me help. And for people who they knew I'd clerked and got to know, they called me if they were dying and let me be part of the nursing team. So I wasn't kind of this intrusive medical student. Oh, hello. Because you're nobody, are you? In that room, there is the person who's dying. There are their beloved people around them. And we are bit part characters somehow allowed the privilege to get into the room but our job is to be out of the way isn't it I know you feel you're intruding you don't have a right to be in that private space and you have to be there to learn but it's so Mm. awkward in the beginning isn't it and they were they were so good at saying and and, you know and this is Catherine and she's our medical student and you know if the the patient was unconscious by then they say you know she's got to know John over the last few weeks and she's she happens to be helping us today but what that taught me was how to be beside a dying person yeah. because at medical school they teach us what to do when we're yes. beside a bed and there isn't a thing to do fidget and tests and things and yeah yeah um, let's oh let's do something let's do a yeah. test yeah and and the nurses have this dignified gentle very professional presence they do this thing and I've seen it happen subsequently throughout my career in Mm -hmm. community in emergencies and the emergency department where this person who you've been chit-chatting to like pals and colleagues opens the door into this scene of devastation and kind of morphs and their body changes all the angles disappear they slow their movements they speak Mm -hmm. very deliberately their voice seems to drop yeah, and they explain things carefully, clearly, small words, no medical showing off vocabulary. Yeah. And really what they're saying is whatever you've got in here, I'm here and I will be with you in it. Yeah. 
And I think perhaps we're taught to say, I will save you from it. Or, yes. you know, I will do something about it. Yes, I will and, make you better. I will keep you going another yeah, day. Yeah, yeah. And the nurses say, it's okay. I'm here. Together we will be able to do this. Whatever this is, yeah. we will be here. And that that was such a gift. So I got that from the nurses on my attachment wards over my third year in medical school. And I think it changed the kind of doctor that I was to become. Yeah, definitely. Now, I remember during training, I spent countless hours as a junior doctor crying in the sluice or the toilets when I lost a patient. How did you cope dealing with death day in, day out on the wards? I remember t- crying in sluices. And, and big linen cupboards are good for crying yes. as well, aren't they? Yes, because yes, the space um, to sit in, they're usually quite warm. I've certainly been given tea and biscuits by the ward housekeeper in the linen Aww. cupboard in, in, in one ward. And at that point, started to think, why are we crying secretly? What is this about? Yeah. And I remember a young woman with breast cancer Mm -hmm. who had had her surgery. Now we're talking mid 1980s. Yeah. And I was a I was the most junior doctor in the regional cancer center. I was still on this. Think I'm going to do. Um, cancer medicine career trajectory at that point and this young woman had been having her chemotherapy after her surgery under our care and had come in and I can't remember now interestingly what the crisis was only that the crisis was related to unexpected distant recurrence. Right. So she was mid-chemo and she clearly had chemo-resistant disease and soft tissue complications somewhere else. Yeah. And she was dying. There was no doubt about it. She was about my age, which would have been mid to late 20s. Yeah. And the oncologist, the radiotherapy oncologist who was looking after her, Mm had been a person who'd always been very kind to me and very interested in my interest in oncology. And I realised by this stage that he had daughters about my age. So he was doing that kind of medical dad role. Yeah. And I bet you've had medical parents to your career as well, people who've done that for us. Yeah. Um, And he came in to see this patient. He interrupted his clinic and came upstairs to see her. And he came out. And he threw his stethoscope down the corridor and he swore like I've never heard somebody swear. And he slammed out of the ward and back down the stairs to his clinic. And the nurses were horrified. I was horrified. And then I realised, oh, goodness, you see, she's my age. I'm the age of his daughters. She's the age of his daughters. This is cruel and terrible. And he is really, really distressed. And we were hiding in the sluice because distress wasn't permitted. Somehow we had to be shiny and smiley and yep. all okay. And that just makes it not okay yep. for the people who really are experiencing those difficult emotions, I which know. are the patients and the families. And I think it's the same today. I never saw my boss cry over a patient who died on the table. I never saw how they have nightmares about complaints. I think we're all, I used to call it internal brown trousers, external calm. We all have to look like competent superheroes and we never show vulnerability. And it's just not fair, is it? No, it's wrong because actually what it's doing is it's creating a pretense, I think. Yeah. Now, clearly, we can't go around just kind of weeping all over our patients. <laughs> but this was somebody who I knew well enough to be able to sit in the room and say, oh, this is awful, isn't it? I am so sorry. Yeah. And you know, what can I do? Who can I be? We've become pals over the weeks and weeks of me sticking up drips and reciting drips and yeah. treating her for her side effects. I'd paraded down the ward one night in her wig at her behest. <laughs> I love it. Um, I had very, very long hair in those days and she yeah. had long hair like mine and she'd chosen this really gorgeous short bob yeah. for her wig. And I'd gone in one night to recite her drip and she said, why don't you try it on? So she (laughs) helped me to style this wig. So she's sitting there in her turban and I've got all of my hair piled up inside the wig. And they're astonishingly 
capacious, aren't they? You know, they, they will are. they will be very forgiving about what's already on your head. Yeah. And then I went off and and had to check some drugs with one of the nurses in charge. And several people said, "Oh, I like your hair." And she said, <laughs> That's really like. I'm going to call her Joanne. That's, good, that's really like Joanne's hair, isn't it? Have, yeah. You should show Joanne because she's wearing a wig <laughs> like that. And she, and then she saw me start to smoke. Oh, it's Joe's hair, isn't it? Oh, mm, that's brilliant. Might be. So, so we were pals. We were yeah. girls together to one extent. And I was healthy and she was not. But we had so many things in common at that time. Why would it not be okay if she was tearful yeah. for me to be her tearful friend at that point? It's there's a line that we've drawn in not quite the right place, I think. You yeah. can be distressed and not unprofessional at the same time. And do you think that's because we're doctors, not nurses? You feel as a doctor, you can't show emotion, you can't hug someone, you can't touch their arm to show your support? I, I don't know. I think that maybe nursing has got that better now than it had but you know it was the nurses who showed me where to cry mm. because that's where they cried too so in those days certainly that would have been frowned upon now what the ward sisters in those days the ward managers would do at the end of a shift would be to take a few minutes just say this has been a tough one how are you all yeah but then our, our good medical seniors would do that and they certainly do do that now don't they to mm, they do. to debrief people at the end of a you really need it yeah absolutely i guess i didn't really think about my own death until i got cancer and i'll be honest before i read your first book um with the end in mind i was terrified about dying and I think it's because I'd only seen bad deaths in hospital as part of a crash team or when someone bled out in theatre. And I think for me, I didn't want to be in pain and I didn't want to be gasping for breath because that's all I saw patients doing. Mm. What is dying actually like? That's such a great question. And your your introduction to your medical experiences, I think, bears some meditation before I move on to describing the process because I think it's a process that's hidden in plain sight yeah isn't discussed by our doctors with us or by our nurses with us and that's partly because they're not sure whether or not we're up for going there when we're patients yeah but it's also about I think the distortion of whether what they've mainly seen is what I call ordinary dying or what you're describing, which is extraordinary dying, the exceptions, the really difficult ones. Yeah. So I want to start by saying that I don't want to pretend that dying is always easy. Yeah. Because it isn't. But it's almost always not that person's worst day. Yeah. And that they will have had more uncomfortable, more difficult days through their lives than this one. But we pin a lot of importance on this day because their death happens in it and then we remember them yeah. at that point. I mean, I've, I've had friends saying, what's their final tweet going to be and the importance of the last message they leave to the world? And it's just not realistic. Yeah, yeah. So thinking about dying, is the, the thing that I think was a revolution to me was having somebody explain it to a patient when I first moved sideways from my cancer medicine training into the local hospice because by then I discovered that actually finding the cure for cancer seemed to be mainly getting up at three o'clock in the morning to wake a patient up at three o'clock in the morning to take blood that they didn't really want to have to give yeah for research trials and then drawing a lot of graphs and actually there were really clever people who were doing that and who were thrilled by it, and who wanted to show you their graphs, and I just wasn't one of those. <laughs> no. um, so round about that same time, I'm starting to realise that there's a kind of two-tier system going on here. There's people who have presented early enough with diseases we can really modify or cure, mm. and again, mid-1980s, the proportion of those was lower then than it is now. Very. And then people who are not going to be cured and what we're doing in the cancer center is trying to modify their disease enough that it alleviates their symptoms but I'm interested in what's going to happen to this person who's got a pain in their leg if they need to get from their bed to the bathroom in the middle of the night and there's nobody to grab onto or you know this person who's who's breathless but who's 
uh, only toilet in the house is upstairs and, and that kind of thing. Yeah. So I went to visit a local hospice really just out of interest and thought, oh, mm-hmm. what's happening here is they've collected all of the people that I'm really, really interested in in the cancer centre and they're just focusing on that thing about the quality of living that I'm so interested in. Yeah. There is a place for me in medicine after all. So oh. that's how I moved sideways. So I was, I've was i been there a little while and I was, I'm trying to think, four years qualified, had chosen cancer specialty wards all the way through my medical training to do the Royal College of Physicians exams. So I'd mm. done, uh, you know, medical officer in charge of the hospital on take yeah, people coming arriving in crisis as well as people just unraveling because of the illnesses that they had. Mm. And I've probably seen several hundred people die by this stage. And so when my boss said to me, "We've got an elderly lady who's very frightened about what's going to happen to her if she dies because she's frightened about being overwhelmed by pain." Yeah, why don't you come with me while I talk to her? I was a bit surprised because I thought that what he was going to do was a pain consultation. Yeah. But actually what he was going to do was a what is dying like conversation. Really? And I was utterly astonished, incredibly uncomfortable and ultimately completely blown away by by what actually happened. So Mm -hmm. he... Sat on her bed, which these days is verboten, isn't it, because of um, yes. infection Everything. control. Yes. Yeah. Anyway, and she had a soft spot for him. She was probably old enough to be his, at least his mother, but possibly his granny. But when he said, <laughs> where shall I sit? She kind of patted the bed and he oh. sat down beside her. And I sat on one of those little stools that are a useless oh, God, type for anything. Those. Yeah. Yes, ruin your um, knees. Yeah. So I could see both of them. And he said to her, so I heard that you were worried about what dying will be like. And I wondered if you'd like to talk about that. And inside me, I I could hear myself thinking, that is probably the most unsubtle introduction to a conversation about dying I've ever heard. Yeah. And, and she just leant forward and nodded and said, yes. And so there's a little light bulb moment. OK, one of the ways that we can talk about dying is by saying that we like to talk about dying okay file that away yep. that's interesting yep. um so he said hey, you know I wonder whether you've ever seen anybody die and what it is that you're expecting so she described having seen a traumatic death during the war mm. and also being with her husband who died about 10 years earlier after a heart attack and he'd been in and out of consciousness said all of the prayers with the priests being really courageous and brave and then gradually become unconscious and stopped breathing. So my boss said to her, well, the thing about dying is that it's a process. It's a body process that everybody's body has. It's a little bit like the way bodies have a process for giving birth. You kind of know Mm -hmm. the things to expect to happen and the order they're probably going to happen in, even though it's a little bit different from one person to another. Yeah. Yeah. So would it be helpful for you if I describe the process to you? And I'm sitting there, you know, with my you know three or four hundred deaths <laughs> under my belt thinking, yeah. how can he possibly describe dying? I mean, doesn't it depend what she's dying of and what illness she's got? Exactly. Blah, 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 blah. You know, yeah. this is ridiculous. Because, Who does he think he is? Yeah, exactly. Because I just, <laughs> you know, I had so much to learn. It's embarrassing really telling the story now. But I think maybe it helps people who are listening to us to just, be with us because actually yeah that is what people think isn't it everybody's going to be different and the truth is everybody is different in the same way as yeah when a woman's given birth she's given that birth to this baby or these babies and it's been an absolutely yeah. unique experience but what the midwife saw was same old same old yeah yeah so yeah you said, completely the thing about dying is that the process starts with people just being tired it doesn't seem to matter what the illness is eventually what starts to happen is very similar to everybody that they just run out of energy and they can't do as much they need to rest more they need to take naps and those little sleeps seem to recharge their batteries 
And you might even find that that's already been happening to you. So just checking, my afternoon nap doesn't mean that I'm... <laughs> I think your afternoon nap is safe. In fact, okay. I, I'm a great Good. encourager of the afternoon nap. <laughs> and, and I think that as, as he even started talking, she's leaning forward and nodding and, and saying, you mm-hmm. know, that might have started already. And she's saying, yes. Okay. And he said, oh, that okay, so that's good. And I'm now, you know, my critic head's going, how can you possibly say that's good? Yeah. Like, I want to disappear. This is so difficult. This is so unexpected. Yeah. It's so awkward. And she is just locked on him. I could just not be there as far as she's concerned. Yeah. And he said, so that's, I think that's good because what that shows us is you're following the normal process. Okay, I get why he's saying that's good. Mm -hmm. So he said, as time goes by, what you're probably going to find is just that you'll sleep more and be awake less. And that that's mainly what's going to happen. Okay. But I know you've been worried about having pain. So I want to ask you, do you trust us to keep you comfortable enough? Wow. And again, I thought that that's such a good question because he didn't say, oh, modern technology, I promise you there's not going to be any pain. Yeah. We can fix it with medicine. He just said, do you trust us? That's just. And do you trust us to keep you comfortable enough? And actually comfortable enough is how we get through our lives, isn't it? It's how we, yeah. it's how we go to work with toothache and how we get through period pains and, you and all the rest of it. You can't promise a life with pain. The number of times I've had kind of genius say you'll be pain-free after the operation no you won't you've been cut you have to be honest don't you yes yes you won't be pain-free after your operation you'll feel like somebody's cut you open because we yes. did <laughs> yes um but it will feel better afterwards so so already yeah. I was seeing this conversation being modeled that was using real words he talked about yeah. death and dying and have you seen somebody die he'd asked about confidence and being comfortable rather than given reassurance about no pain at all. Mm-hmm. And he started to talk about this process. And this was a thing I hadn't heard before of this tiredness. And as he's saying it, and I'm reflecting on my year I've just spent in the cancer centre and thinking, yeah, that's right, isn't it? That is what we see. So he carried on. So as, as time goes by, what we find is people are asleep more and more and they're awake less and less, mm-hmm. as long as their symptoms don't disturb them. And During that time, a time will come when something interesting happens to the person that we notice, but they don't, which is that maybe there's a visitor or a phone call or something that the person would want to be awake for. So Mm -hmm. we try to wake them up and we can't waken them. They are not just asleep. They've dipped from being asleep into for a few minutes or half an hour or so being completely unconscious they're not rousable. Wow. And when they wake up, they tell us they've had a nice sleep. They've had no sense at all of having been unconscious, but we know that they were. Wow. And I'm thinking, oh, yeah, mm-hmm. that's true too, isn't it? I have seen that. So as he's describing it to her, he's really describing it to me. Yeah. And he said, so one of the things that's important at that stage is Some people might be taking painkillers or drugs for breathlessness or nausea or things like that. Mm -hmm. If they're going to dip in and out of unconsciousness, we don't want them to miss the dose of drugs that keeps them comfortable. We don't want them to be wakened later on by the pain coming back or being breathless or whatever. Of course. So at that point, we would talk to you about swapping from drugs that you have to be awake enough to swallow to using drugs in a different way and because she was French they then had and he was a French speaker Uh they had a completely unnecessary conversation about suppositories um, (laughs) which would have been the preferred route in France and then he described how we would use a syringe driver and it wouldn't be any different Uh, the drug dose would be adjusted so it's the same effective dose and we often find that when people are getting more drowsy we switch to syringe drivers and families sometimes think that it's the drugs in the syringe driver that are making the person drowsy whereas in fact it's exactly the opposite way around we're only using the syringe driver now because the person might be too drowsy to take those drugs by mouth anymore yeah so he, he said to her, so we might want to do that and would that be okay with you if that's what we needed to do and she said yes that would be fine so he said okay so now we once we know that the person's symptoms are unlikely to come back and cause them any trouble they just go into this 
cycle of being awake for periods and asleep for periods and gradually dipping into deeper and deeper unconsciousness until they're completely unconscious all of the time. So if you feel drowsy enough to need a nap, that's not how unconsciousness feels. It's absolutely safe to take a nap. People don't know when they're becoming unconscious. Got you. So you have your naps, you enjoy your naps, you relish your naps. And she's nodding. Sounds quite nice, actually. It does. So he said, eventually, the person is just deeply unconscious all of the time. And once somebody's completely unconscious, the only bit of their brain that's really working normally is the bit that drives our breathing. Um, because they're not awake to attend to their breathing, ah. their respiratory center in the back of their brain goes into an automatic cycle. And it looks a little bit like this, that some of the time it's slow and then it might get faster and then slower again. And in the very slow foot phases, there might be pauses. And some of the time it's shallow and some of the time it's deeper. And so we sometimes have to explain to families about this breathing that they're seeing because they've never seen it before. Yeah. And it can be troubling to families if they don't understand it. I think it's troubling to junior doctors. I remember seeing patients who were having that breathing thing. God, that patient must be struggling so much. And it really in distress for thinking about it. But it's not. It's absolutely right. Absolutely right. And and as he was describing it, again, all these light bulbs are coming on in my head. Yeah. So he's saying, so sometimes people can't feel um, whether their throat is open or closed. So they might be breathing out, but they're breathing out with their vocal cords closed, which is the way we speak. So they may yeah. breathe and make a noise that sounds like a sigh or a moan. Mm -hmm. And if your family are here with you and they hear that, they might think you're unconscious. And obviously we'll check. Yeah. But almost always, it's simply a sign that the person is so deeply unconscious that they're not aware of their throat. And sometimes it might be that the phase of the breathing is fast and it's also at a shallow phase. And that can sound like somebody panting and they might yeah. think that you were short of breath. So we would check, but almost always. It's this reflex breathing. And in fact, it tells us that the person is deeply unconscious. Wow. So when you think, Liz, of the of the noises that we hear around deathbeds, yeah. and we also hear them in neuro emergencies, don't we? When people have been yeah. rendered unconscious by head injuries or whatever. Yeah. This is an unconsciousness breathing. The person doesn't know it's going on, but it looks like a struggle. And we call it the death rattle, don't well, we? Yeah. And if we don't explain to families what's going on, what they think is, well, there's fluid in the back of the throat. Yeah. It must be welling up from the lungs. My dad is drowning. Yes. Or that this person is making these strange noises as they're breathing my grandmother is desperately trying to speak and nobody understands what she's saying and so we've got to step up at that point and say these noises that we're hearing I want you to know that these are the noises of deeply unconscious breathing and they mean that this person is way beyond being able to feel distress yeah. or discomfort so this isn't a struggle for them it's simply the pattern of breathing when people are deeply unconscious. So as he was explaining it to her, she's kind of sitting up more and more. She's got hold of his hands. She's stroking his hands. And I can feel my eyes are full of tears because it was an absolute revelation to me. As he's describing it, I'm thinking, yeah. I've seen this hundreds of times and yet I've never yeah. seen it at all. I've been so busy worrying about you know, that person's blood pressure and that person's heart rate and that person's kidney function. I haven't stood back and thought about the pattern that's happening to everybody. I'm too busy fiddling with the details of each individual person. Yeah. And so he said to at the very, very end of somebody's life, what happens is their breathing just very gently slows down and eventually there's a breath out that just doesn't have another breath in afterwards yeah it's as gentle as that there's no kind of sudden rush of pain at the end no feeling of fading away no no panic and I could see as she was listening to him her eyes were closing her shoulders were dropping she was relaxing and there was this kind of very very long pause at the end 
and she kissed his hands. Wow. And at that point, he, he said, shall we leave you? And she kind of waved her fingers to indicate yeah. that it was time for us all to, to <laughs> depart. And as we're walking yeah. down the corridor, I'm, I am thinking, I don't know where to look. I'm cut, my eyes are streaming. I hope he doesn't need yeah. me to speak because I just am not going to be able to say anything. And, no. Uh, and he was so good. And he said to me, do you think we should have a cup of tea? And I said, yes, oh. please. And Kills I went everything. off to make the tea. Yeah, thank God oh. I went to make the tea. God, you've got me crying. But what a revelation. Because it's so moving to hear somebody telling the absolute truth and the absolute truth yeah. really enabling somebody to say, this person isn't messing with my, my mind. They're not trying to, you know, improve no. my mood. They are telling me with complete integrity from a long experience what is likely to happen. And that makes me believe them in a way that I might not believe if they were trying to make it better than it is. It is noisy. It is a little bit awkward sounding. Yeah. And yet this person but isn't having discomfort. And no. the thing is now we can go into a room alongside families and say, what do you think about your husband's breathing? Yeah. What do you think about the way your uncle is making these funny noises as he's breathing in and breathing out here? Um, and yeah. that funny clicking noise that we call the death rattle. Yeah. Oh, yes. Well, so that's probably the fluid we used for cleaning that person's mouth a little while ago, or some saliva, or some you know phlegm from down yeah. the back of their nose. It's a tiny little layer of fluid, but it's over the back of their throat. And if you or I had that film of fluid, and I I, I say this to families, imagine if you'd just got like a toast crumb or a bit of tea had gone down the wrong way. What would we be doing? And they they talk up. about yeah, we'd be coughing, yeah. we'd be retching. Yeah. There's no way we'd let it sit there. Okay, so this person you love is so deeply unconscious that it can't even feel the part of the back of their throat that is one of the most sensitive parts of our body. We've evolved for it to be sensitive mm. to save us from ever choking. And now it's they are so switched off in their brain that they're not even feeling the back of their throat. They're not making any attempt to clear this. Yeah. It's a tiny amount of fluid and the clicking is the air bubbling in and out of their airway as they carry on peacefully breathing. They're not aware of it, no. but it's such a strange noise. And in fact, it's the only example I can think of in medicine where sometimes people will be given a drug to dry up their saliva yeah. to stop them making that noise. And it's not for their comfort. It's for the comfort of the people around the bed. I don't know any other time when we treat one person to no. help everybody else, do you? It's crazy, isn't it? Yeah. I say you have, you've got my tears welling up. It just, it just explains everything. And I'm just thinking of all the patients I've done a disservice to because I didn't know how to explain to them what was going on. And I think it's really hard to have those conversations when you're not used to it. And I know your second book, Listen, talks about how to have important conversations with people. Yeah. What made you write it? There was a huge, huge postback from the first book from With the End in Mind. Mm -hmm. A lot of it was actually about the conversation we have just had because that yeah. story of my boss talking to that lady is, is very early on in the book. Yeah. And so lots and lots of people writing and saying, do you know what? I've been for years carrying the burden of thinking the person I love suffered horribly as they were taking their last breaths over those last few hours. And I realize now that actually they were just doing normal dying. They were deeply unconscious. They won't have been distressed. And why didn't anybody tell us? Why didn't anybody explain? So that was part of the correspondence. But the yeah. other bit of the correspondence was, okay, You've convinced me that these are things we need to talk about. But how do we do that? How do we start? How do I get my elderly parents to tell me what their wishes are? Without thinking you want all their money. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or, or, or I'm a person with a terminal illness and I cannot get my family to let me talk about it. I yeah. want to talk about who should be there, what I want to happen, where I want to be. And they keep saying, oh, you know, you're not nearly that sick yet. We really don't need to talk about this now. Yeah. And I want the peace of mind of having had the conversation. Um, so when I was talking to my publishers, I was saying, you know, I think there's space for a book about conversations. 
Mm. And they were keen for a second book. They'd been very keen for a second book, but they didn't want to write a book just for the sake of writing a book. I didn't want like a, yeah. you know, a vanity project. So I realised this was something that needed writing. And then they said, but we don't need another death book. I thought, okay, that's, uh. that's awkward. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so obviously there is, the, you know, I, I am who I am. So therefore there is a bit of death in this one, but it sort of transcends across the, the life cycle. So, you know, those conversations with, t- with teenagers who are trying to work out who they are and what the world is about. Yeah conversations had in anger how dealing with family disagreements all of those things where what we think we need to do is give somebody a really good talking to and actually the secret of success is to completely turn that on its head and give that person that you don't agree with that person that you just don't understand why they're behaving in this way this person who wants to talk about something that feels really awkward to you and you really don't want to have the conversation yeah. give them a really good listening to instead and actually as we listen and understand how it is from their perspective the response that we feel will guide the words that we use next we don't need to think about a formula no. and the right words and a script we just need to shut up And let them explain. It's like sitting in the silence. And I think I was very, very bad at doing this as a doctor. I hate the silence. I want to fill the silence with words to ease my own discomfort. I really recognise that. And I've been that doctor too. And I think the thing that I've realised over the years, and again, I've watched nurses modelling it. And I think it's perhaps because I've watched nurses having conversations during nursing care so they are necessarily present because it's a bed bath yeah or because there's a linen change going on or because they're helping somebody to move around the room and the conversation is happening at the same time Mm -hmm. so when silence arises they just quietly carry on soaping or stroking the sore tummy or yeah. helping the person take one deliberate step at a time so there's something else happening yeah but what you can observe is that there's a silence that is not well we call it in, in the English expression is an awkward silence isn't it we do feel awkward about silence mm-hmm. yeah what's going on is that silence is where all the work is happening where all the thinking is going on. Yeah. Silence is where we contemplate stuff. Silence is where we make our minds up. Silence is where we change our minds. And if people keep the interrupting talk, it, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Like me, I've just done now. Bad Liz. <laughs> <laughs> but it but it is a thing, isn't it? And it's particularly difficult when you're doing something like this where we can't see each other. So telephone calls can be really difficult because Mm. if we were in a room together the our body language would say oh yeah we're both in a kind of quiet contemplative space together or your eye gaze would say I'm ready to talk now are you ready yeah or my eye gaze would say I'm still deep in this thought and and we would read each other and not interrupt so one of the things in the book that I've talked about is how do you mimic that um, in a phone call and, and one of the things is simply to say things that say you know the line is still connected but without calling the person's attention out of their thoughts so things like take your time yeah it's okay there's lots to think about or just yeah or hmm, yeah perfect uh-huh. and and just letting them tick over in their thoughts And we're just making enough noise that they know that we're not getting impatient, but we are prepared to be present. It's, I think, a book we all need to read. Now, here's a question. How do you switch off from talking and writing about death all the time? Or do you ever? Um, I, I, well, I was a runner and I've torn my meniscus. Oh. But doing something else doing something that just gets us into flow is really the thing that makes life bearable isn't it so Mm. I haven't done enough gardening this year and it really shows but gardening was the thing that I I did really love to do and a really good weeding session 
Oh, yes. Because afterwards you can see what you've achieved. And you ache all over. It's a good workout, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's very, very thorough. And actually, because we've got quite a big garden, I can see what I've done and I can feel this moment of satisfaction and I can see how tiny it is compared with what remains to be done. And then I feel very despondent again. I know. And then you can just weed one border all week, can't you? Because it's you just coming back. You absolutely could. So so exercise is good. Uh, my husband, who's retired now, was a pathologist and so we were real wow at parties you know? <laughs> so somebody would say to me what do you do and I would explain what my job was and you could you could see them then panic you know the eyes dotting yes. from side to side change the subject change the subject oh Great. oh no how lovely what does your husband do you think no if you're uncomfortable with what I do you really don't want to no. go there you'll help them die and he'll cut them up when they die well Perfect. well only only if they're tiny though because he actually was particularly interested in in children and babies Oh, gosh, that's tough. So he needed to be able to find ways to clear his mind. Um, And again, he's a runner, but also he's got this absolutely eclectic taste in music. And our kids would just say, oh, what's dad listening to now? And some nights (laughs) it would be, you know, heavy rock and other nights there would be uh, classical music or it would be yeah. kind of bebop jazz or whatever so our kids have had a musical education based on their parents relaxation activities after work fantastic but just finding things and and actually just getting lost in a really good book do you know just living somebody else's life um, yeah really wonderful novels I just I absolutely love that and I've missed having the space to read for pleasure while I've been writing. So I've got a stack now that I'm looking forward to. I found it really hard to quiet my brain and just enjoy doing nothing and reading without worrying. It's hard to find the time just to switch off and have that guilt-free couple of hours, I think, with a really good book. What have you got next on your list to read? Do you know? I've got a variety of things, but I was given uh, for Christmas last year by my friend of mine who's a classicist, a book called Pandora's Jar by Natalie Haynes. Um, and it's a retelling of the Greek myths from the point of view of the women in Ooh, Greek mythology. Pandora's jar is a really good segue into my final question. And I could talk for hours and hours, but I have to let you go. But I started a jar of joy when I found out my cancer had grown during chemo. And that was the lowest moment of my life so far because I knew just how bad things might be. Mm. And so I got a goldfish bowl. And every time something good happened, I'd write it on a card and put it in the jar. And just seeing that jar full of happy memories, it would always lift me when I was in a dark place. And I'm asking every guest to write something on a card to put in the jar. So can you share with us one thing that's made you smile in the last couple of days? Oh, what a great question. So I have just come back from celebrating my dad's 90th birthday. (gasps) Oh! Wow. So during our family gathering, which we haven't been able to meet as an extended family for nearly two years now, we've mm-hmm. celebrated my dad and we've met the youngest member of our extended family, who's my new great nephew. Oh. And so dad is 90 and Charlie is six weeks old. And it was the most joyful gathering and it's been absolutely lovely so there I think there were 28 of us sitting picnicking in my parents back garden over the weekend and just looking around all of these people the ones who belong to us by direct family connection and the ones who've joined us by being the the partners of the family it's just such a fantastic thing to see all of these happy people and particularly the next generation down from mine who are just starting out on their lives. You've got so much uh, to yeah. look forward to, finding their partners, making their careers and for one of them starting their family. It's just been an absolute joy. So that would be a really shiny thing in my jar of joy. That's definitely going in. Thank you so much, Catherine. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. And that brings us to the end of this episode of Don't Ignore the Elephant. My own death used to be something that really frightened me. But after talking to Catherine, I'm not scared anymore. She's left me feeling all emotional. 
we laughed and we cried and I just feel like I've had a great big hug. One of those that you didn't know you needed but you're really glad you had. If you want to buy Catherine's new book, listen, How to Find the Words for Tender Conversations. It's out now in all good bookshops. I can't recommend it enough and it's certainly changed how I tackle the elephant in the room with friends. Please let me know if this episode has helped you. I love hearing your stories. The response to the first three episodes has blown me away. And the podcast Jar of Joy is quickly filling up. Here are some of last week's entries. Sonia Bradford said she loved spending time with her granddaughter. Annie Ruth 29 was thrilled about getting a haircut that looked intentional for the first time since chemo, and I know exactly what you mean, Annie. Dave Hartin said someone coming back and saying thank you for talking through a decision with them. And I know how much it means when you get feedback as a doctor from a patient. Bevy said St Albans winning in the FA Cup and being there to see it. That must have been an amazing match. And finally, Etty Martin 57 said visiting my friend for the first time in two years. I hope you both had a lovely time. In the next episode, I'm going to be speaking about breaking the glass ceiling and overcoming anxiety with a Eurosports broadcaster, Orla Shenoui. She's had to fight to make it to the top in the male-dominated world of men's cycling whilst tackling postnatal depression and crippling anxiety. She'll be talking to me about what she does on a daily basis to cope, and I can't wait for you to hear it. If you've enjoyed the show, make sure you subscribe so the next episode is ready when you are. And if you do have a few seconds spare in your day, it would be wonderful if you could leave a review and let me know what you thought. It really does mean a lot. Thank you for listening. Don't Ignore the Elephant is produced by Birdline Media in partnership with Elizabeth Richards.